Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to the final part of our series of videos focusing on terrifying crimes that happened aboard ships. If you haven't seen parts 1 and 2, be sure to check those out first. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part three of three terrifying crimes that happened aboard ships. On the afternoon of September 7th, 1982, Alaska State Troopers were alerted to a fire aboard a fishing boat anchored off the coast of the town of Craig. The vessel was called the Investor, a 58-foot Delta Marine Signer fishing boat which had been purchased just a year earlier by its owner, a 28-year-old salmon fisherman named Mark Colthurst. But curiously, the call the troopers received was not from Mark or any of his crew members. The fire had been spotted by the crew of an entirely different vessel called the Casino, who had noticed smoke billowing from the investor as it sat quietly anchored close to nearby Fish Egg Island. The crew of the casino headed over to the investor as quickly as they could after alerting authorities, and on their way encountered a young man in a small boat heading for the shore. It looked as though the man had just left the scene of the fire, and when he was questioned by crew members of the casino, he confirmed that he was going to get help. When the crew of the casino arrived at the fire, they quickly learned that they were woefully unprepared to fight the blaze. Soon, they were joined by state troopers, members of the local police department, and eventually the U.S. Coast Guard, who had to fly out water pumps to assist with putting out the blaze. After hours of work, the fire had died down enough that emergency responders were finally able to board the investor to look for anyone who might have survived the fire. Sadly, they discovered what appeared to be the remains of at least four people, whose bodies had been burned beyond recognition. However, the emergency responders were soon prevented from searching for additional victims or clues as to what had happened when flames once again broke out aboard the investor. It would take several more hours until the blaze was put out for good, by which time the remains of the initial four people pulled from the boat had been sent to Anchorage to be examined. On September 9th, autopsies were conducted and two of the bodies were identified as Mark Colthurst and his wife Irene, who was three months pregnant. As the investigation continued, the revelations would only grow darker, as authorities quickly realized that what had happened aboard the investor was no accident. It turned out that Mark and Irene had each been shot in the head and were likely killed before the fire had even started. A closer examination of the wreckage of the ship also seemed to suggest that the fire had been set deliberately. Rather than starting at the back of the ship where the fuel was stored, it had started in the front of the ship where the living quarters were located and had burned most intensely where the bodies were discovered. Investigators speculated that whoever had set the fire had likely done it to cover up the murders of those on board. As days passed and authorities meticulously worked through the burned out remains of the ship, they were able to identify more victims. First was Mark and Irene's young daughter Kimberly, followed by Mark's cousin and deckhand, 19-year-old Mike Stewart. Another member of the crew, 19-year-old Jerome Kuhn, was also eventually identified thanks to a piece of jawbone that investigators were able to compare to dental records. Though Kuhn was the last official person to be identified based on remains found at the scene, authorities knew that there were likely three more people on board the investor at the time of the fire. Two additional teenage crew members named Chris Heyman and Dean Moon, as well as Mark and Irene's other young child, John. Because of John's age, it made little sense to suspect that he would have been anywhere other than with his parents at the time of the murders, and authorities theorized that no trace of him could be found because his body was likely left in the area of the living quarters where the fire had burned most intensely. Investigators were less certain about the fates of Chris Heyman and Dean Moon. Due to the extent of the damage that the fire had caused, the men could never be positively identified amongst the bones and bone fragments that were left behind. 
Because of this, investigators could not rule out their possible involvement in the crime. Though Mark and Irene were the only two of the victims who were confirmed to have died from gunshot wounds, authorities concluded that all of the victims aboard the investor had likely died before the fire had started. As evidence, they pointed to the fact that none of the four bodies that had initially been pulled from the wreckage had showed signs of carbon monoxide being trapped in their lungs, which would have been consistent with someone who had died in a fire. As the investigation continued, authorities began to piece together the final days of the Colthurst family and the crew of the investor. They learned that the boat had pulled into the port of Craig on Sunday, September 5th, and had been hauling almost 80,000 pounds of salmon from fishing the previous week. Because Alaska's Department of Fish and Game had temporarily closed the fishing season, Mark and his crew had to hang around Craig for a couple of days, until the final part of the season reopened on Monday, and they could be officially paid for their latest catch. After unloading its hull that afternoon, the investor was tied to two other ships on the North Cove dock, called the Defiant and the Decade. This was so that the ship would not float away, but meant that the Colthurst family and the crew of the investor would need to walk across both ships to get onto the dock to access the town. That night, the Colthurst family was seen eating at one of Craig's few local restaurants. They had gone there to celebrate Mark's 28th birthday. Witnesses told investigators that the family was at the restaurant until approximately 9.30 p.m., after which they returned to the ship. They were last seen by a crew member of the decade while crossing back over to their own ship just before 10 p.m. It was the next morning that the first strange details in the record began to emerge. At approximately 6.30 a.m., a crewman from the decade noticed the investor slowly pulling away from the dock. Due to the lack of noise, it appeared as though the ship's main engine was not running and that the boat was simply being dragged out to sea by the current. The crew member spotted a man in the investor's pilot house, where the ship's steering controls, navigation tools, and compass were located. The man appeared to be quietly steering the investor out of the port. The crewman assumed that this was Mark Colthurst, though based on the distance, it was not possible to make a positive identification. It was only later that the crewman learned that the tie lines which belonged to the investor and that had been used to secure it to the decade the previous day had been left behind. This was quite bizarre, as the lines were extremely expensive and were meant to be constantly reused. A short while later, a crew member from another ship saw the investor close to Fish Egg Island, the spot where it would eventually be found on fire. It appeared as though the ship had been anchored. It is believed that the investor never moved again from this point on but that this fact failed to draw any suspicion because that morning a heavy fog rolled into the area, concealing the boat to other vessels on the water. Not only that, but with fishing resuming that morning, it likely would have been hectic in the port, and people were mostly concerned with finishing up the last bit of the season so that they could go home to their families. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, that day was also supposed to be the day that Irene Colthurst caught a flight back to their family home in Blaine, Washington, with her two children. She and the kids had only come to visit Mark on the boat for a couple of weeks, and with school starting in a few days, they needed to return home while Mark finished up the rest of the salmon fishing season. The last crucial witness sightings police were informed of all had to do with an unknown man in his 20s, as well as the investor's skiff a small boat that was used to ferry people and supplies from the investor to the mainland when the boat was not docked. The skiff had been seen by several different people on September 6th and had reportedly been tied to Craig's main dock for a few hours that day. The next morning, the skiff was again seen at the dock, along with the unknown man in his 20s. The man had been seen purchasing two and a half gallons of gasoline in Craig that morning, and was then spotted departing the dock in the small boat. It was believed this was the same man that the crew of the casino had spotted, leaving the scene of the fire later that afternoon. After that, several other witnesses recalled seeing the man after he returned to the dock in Craig one final time, and at least three of these witnesses claimed that they had spoken to the man. They said that he had also pretended that he was getting help to extinguish the fire, and in the ensuing chaos, had managed to slip away. 
despite the ample eyewitness evidence that seemingly should have helped identify the unknown suspect. Many of the details were contested. Though authorities eventually settled on a description of the man and managed to compile it into a single profile, it initially proved less helpful than they had anticipated. The suspect was described as a young, thin, white man in his late teens or early twenties, with longish blonde or light brown hair and a slightly scarred complexion. As the mayor of Craig later pointed out in an interview, there were probably 500 guys in the town at the time that looked just like him, and no one likely would have paid any attention. For two years after the brutal crime, little progress was made in the case. Authorities worked to chase down leads, but nothing seemed to stick. The investigation was made even more difficult by the fact that almost all of the witnesses and potential perpetrators in the case lived out of state, and were only in Alaska for the fishing season. This meant doing a lot of legwork even to follow up on basic leads or to conduct interviews. In the middle of 1984, a presumptive death hearing was held in an Alaskan court, which determined that Dean Moon and Chris Heyman had been among the victims on the investor, officially taking the theory of their possible involvement in the case off the table. The Colthurst's son, John, was also declared dead at the same hearing. Still, authorities refused to let the case die, and put particular effort into speaking with witnesses in Washington State, where the Colthurst family had lived, in order to make sure that the leads kept coming in. Finally, in September of 1984, just a few days after the second anniversary of the brutal crime, police announced that they had arrested and charged a man named John Kenneth Peel with all eight murders. According to authorities, Peel's name had come up many times during their investigation, as several fishermen had reported his alleged resemblance to the artist's sketches that had been created based on witness descriptions of the unknown man on the skiff. However, it was Peel's supposed history with Mark Colthurst that had finally convinced investigators he was the perpetrator. Not only had Peel formerly dated Mark's sister, he had reportedly worked as a deckhand for him in 1980 and 1981. Authorities said that they had learned through interviews that Peel had been fired by Mark for his supposed drug and alcohol abuse problems, and that this had permanently caused a falling out between them. Though Peel had managed to subsequently find work on another boat in the 1982 season, investigators speculated that he had held a grudge, and that this could have been the motive behind the killings. According to police, Peel had also failed the polygraph test during their interviews with him. In early 1986, the case went to trial. The evidence against Peel was entirely circumstantial, based on the perceived bad blood between him and Mark, as well as the many witnesses who now alleged that they had clear memories of Peel at crucial points in time leading up to the murders. Peel's lawyers, meanwhile, argued that the falling out between him and Mark had been wildly exaggerated, and that not only had he sought work elsewhere willingly in 1982, but that Mark and Irene had purchased a wedding gift for him after he had left the crew. The defense also pointed out that for as many people that claimed to have seen Peel around the time of the murders, many others had not been able to make a positive identification, or else had outright said the unknown person they had seen was not him. The contentious trial lasted for more than six months, and reportedly included more than 800 pieces of evidence and 150 witnesses. It also cost the state of Alaska more than $2 million. At the end, after six days of deliberation, the jury informed the presiding judge that they had been unable to come to a consensus. After a mistrial was declared, the state decided that they wanted to try Peel again, and in January of 1988, the second trial began. This time, the proceedings took three months and ended in Peel being acquitted. Two years after the acquittal, Peel filed a $177 million lawsuit against the state for wrongful prosecution after having spent a good portion of his 20s embroiled in legal conflict over the 1982 murders. That suit would spend an additional seven years working its way through the legal system until Peel finally settled for a reported $900,000. It has now been decades since the infamous killings aboard the Investor took place, 
and the case remains highly regarded as the worst unsolved mass murder in Alaska's history. Despite the acquittal in the case, the investigation remains closed, as authorities still believe they found the correct perpetrator the first time. In an interview after his second trial, John Peel was asked what he thought it would take to clear his name in the minds of investigators. He replied, for them to solve the case. That brings us to the end of our list. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.